All right. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here. We're very happy about the great turnout, and let's just get started with today's event. How to get paid, a guide on how to work jobs as a medical student. Um, and this is a little conversation that we're going to have about working jobs while studying medicine here. As we know, it can be quite a daunting task for a lot of medical students who just arrived in the Czech Republic. And we've gone through those ups and downs. So we've taken this time today to speak about those um, experiences and kind of help you to get your own job. I would just like to point out before we get started that to maintain the flow of this um, talk, we would like to keep all the questions in the chat. So please do not turn on your mics during the event. All right, so the structure of this conversation, um, we begin with what to consider before getting a job. Then we will have our speakers um, talk about different types of jobs. We have Selena Gupta talking about hospitality jobs. We have Isabel Newsell talking about babysitting jobs. And we have myself talking about teaching jobs. And we end with um, Yasmin and Soy talking about medical jobs. Then we have our special guest speaker, Jan Chermak, who will be giving us some tips about um, legal uh, matters pertaining to employment and taxes. All right, so what to consider um, or what to ask yourself before you um, get a job here? First, you want to know if you're allowed to work here or not. And the short answer is yes, you are allowed to work in Czech Republic um, unless you have certain cases. And I think Mr. Jan will talk about that later. Um, you should ask yourself how much time do you have on your hands? Um, I know as you start medical school, you, um, the first year is quite demanding. Freshers really don't have time to work jobs. But as you go through the years, you gain the experience and you gain the time um, during your day, which you can spend um, probably doing a job. You should really consider if the pay is worth it for the job. Um, there are many jobs out there that may not pay you well enough for your effort and time, and you won't want to do those jobs because in the end, they seem um, more of a task than, you know, um, more of a task than they're worth. So don't take up jobs which pay you like, I don't know, 80, 90 crowns an hour, those jobs are probably not worth your time. Um, how much um, Czech do I speak or how much Czech do you speak? This is um, really important because if you speak a, um, pretty good Czech or decent Czech, you can take up more jobs um, than other people can. So really consider improving your Czech skills. And what talents do I have that I can make use of? Um, a lot of people, when they graduate high school, they think, oh, I don't have a qualification or I don't have any talent that I can use in a job, but that's normally not true. Uh, most of the students here speak fluent English, and I think um, that is quite important, um, as you can use that to teach English um, to people here, and it's quite a rewarding job. So really consider your talents um, before um, applying for jobs, because the next point is, should I make a new CV? Um, you'd want to make a different CV for different kinds of job that you apply for. So you don't want to apply with your medical CV for a hospitality job. You need to um, basically just add your relevant experiences um, to the CV um, for the job that you're applying for. So don't spread yourself too wide. Just apply for jobs that are good for you. Um, yeah. So. Those were some of the points that you should consider before getting a job. And now we have um, Selena Gupta, who will be speaking about hospitality jobs. Selena is a fourth year student at First Faculty of Medicine. She is also part of the education team here at UIMS. So please, Selena, take it away. Thank you, Ollie. So hi, everyone. Uh, if you can't read it by my name already, I'm Selena. And uh, I've basically, I have about five years of waitressing experience, but when it comes to the Czech Republic, I've been waitressing for now a few months. So I've been looking, I had been looking at a lot of jobs in waitressing and really 
kind of checking out the pay as well. And I found that the pay for hospitality jobs, for the most case, is anything in between 120 to 150 crowns per hour. And um, coincidentally enough, the average wage in Prague before COVID, this was, um, it was actually 130 crowns per hour. Um, so yes, you could say that the pay is comparatively lower than what you hear in other, in other occupations. Um, in terms of the perks uh, of these jobs, so a lot of the time, depending on how well the restaurant is doing, your tips can be quite high. So for example, in a five hour shift where I, where I work, um, I could be earning maybe let's say about 700 crowns and then the tips that I receive could also actually be 700 crowns. So I end up actually getting double the salary. So even though my salaries would be like 120 per hour, I would technically actually be working for about 214 hours. So it really does depend on the, like how successful the restaurant is. You also can get free meals as an employee, as well as a staff discount if you visit as a guest. So the free meals are really good because you are allowed to essentially, you know, kind of sell, not just sell the food to a customer by just guessing that it's good. You actually know for yourself that it's actually really, really good. Um, and that makes it easier to sell product to the customer as well. In terms of the pitfalls, though, um, these two things that I've just mentioned, so the tips and the free meals, uh, they're extremely variable and it really does depend on the restaurant. Um, so, for example, if, if it, again, if it's not doing so well, the tips will definitely decrease. And in terms of free meals, you might not be able to even be able to eat them because if it's a really, really busy shift, you just have to eat on the go. You don't actually get to sit down and just eat food as you normally would. Um, and then also in terms of getting these jobs. Uh, so, again, you can either do it in person or you can do it on Facebook. So in person, um, the nice thing is that you're able to represent yourself. Uh, not just in person, literally, but also on paper when you hand in a CV. And it really shows that you have initiative to go and, and you're enthusiastic to work. Um, however, it is also heavily dependent on who you know, and that can really determine your success. So for example, when I got my waitressing job, I instantly told a couple of my friends when you were looking for jobs, because we all want to work together. And, you know, a job is always going to be really fun when your friends are in on, in, in on it as well. So um, that can really determine your success because it's not necessarily about how you go about doing it or how good you are. It sometimes really does depend on who you know. So as for Facebook, so Facebook is very much a waiting game. And unfortunately, depending on the current demand, it is heavily influenced by the pandemic, which means that I was actually on Facebook just before the pandemic started. Um, and I waited for like a good two years before I actually was able to get anything that suited me. And I was able to actually find any kind of job that was a, a waitressing job. However, the nice thing with Facebook is that you can actually tell your preferences to each particular job that you're searching for. And you can find this by um, just clicking on the, on the categories that you want. So I clicked hospitality or waitressing or waiter. Um, you can also join other Facebook groups as well to search for opportunities. So some of these could be, um, like expat jobs in Prague or jobs in Prague you can literally just search it up as randomly as you want as you were doing like a google search and you, you can have something always come up for you as well but the nice thing to go for these groups the nice thing about these groups is that they post very often um or if not then you can post and say hi I'm someone who's just looking for some work can anyone dm me or something um you also will have to type out your experience in every application so when you apply for a job um you will need to fill in some sort of cv um, and it can get quite repetitive and really annoying, especially if it's over a phone. It's the screen is small. It's hard to do. It's not as efficient. However, a hack for that one is if you actually fill out your previous work on um, your homepage, on your like your main page where it says like work, events, and jobs, then it kind of comes in as like a pre-filled CV. So you can literally select and unselect the options that you you wouldn't you would either need or not need necessarily so if I was applying for a you know a waitressing job they don't need to know that I also tutored as well basically so you can just kind of select the ones that you want and lastly because it is Facebook watch out for scammers <laughs> um so for example if they don't have a pay that's stated or if they don't give you proper hours essentially after you've spoken to them um or if even if you just look at the comments and it doesn't look you know, too appealing and uh, also check the description and details of the job as well, as well as if the restaurant actually exists, because again, they could be scamming you. Um, make sure that you have those things in mind when you're looking at Facebook. And I welcome the floor for any questions. No, no questions? Great, cool, wonderful, thanks. All right.
Thank you, Selena. And <clears throat> no question for you. So we can move on to the next one. Next, we have Isabel Musel. She is a fifth year student at the second faculty of medicine. She's also the head of social events at LF2 Ames. And yeah, she's going to be speaking about babysitting jobs. Isabel, please take it away. Hello, everyone. Um, all right, so just a bit of background about me. I'm a fifth year medical student in Prague, and I've been a babysitter for about since my third year. And I babysit a French German family, so they're an expat family of three little girls that are now aged three, five, and seven. And they live in, in the city center in, in Prague, too, or so. Um, when I first started, of course, they were much younger. The, the youngest one was like one, barely one years old. So it was quite a, quite a handful, as you can imagine. Um, so how I got this job was that um, there was an upper year student, a sixth year student at the time who was graduating the following year. And so she needed someone to replace her. So she was looking for a replacement. And so she, and at the time I was also just looking for jobs because I had never had, uh, I never had a job as a student. And I was um, very interested in doing it, finding a babysitting job specifically, because I'm the youngest in my family, and I so I have no experience with young kids or any experience at all with small small people. So I thought, why not give it a try? And um, after I graduate, I want to specialize in pediatrics. So I thought it'd be a great way just to gain some experience and try it out. And so she contacted me, and I met up with the family, and then we took it straight from there. Um, the pay is about usually 150 to 200 uh, crowns per hour. Um, I say in this range because it depends on their, their usually they can be quite like my family is quite flexible. If I work, let's say two hours and a half or a little bit more, then they usually just round up or they just give me, they just give me more or less in the range of 150 to 200. My hours are like, um, I, so I go two to three times. So I go twice a week fixed. And then usually in the evening, some, some evenings I go as well. And sometimes they ask me to stay longer, for example. So I usually go from about afternoon 4.30 until about 7, 7.30. And sometimes they ask me to stay until 10 or 11. So it really just varies from week to week. Um, I just wrote down some pros and cons about this job. So of course, the pro, the, one of my favorite pros is that like, I find it always as a really good way to de-stress and just to have some carefree time. Because of course, when you walk around a park with some kids and they're running around looking at, at like rocks and trees and they're so amused by everything, it's really refreshing. You're just constantly staring at a computer screen or constantly are living a very stressful life. So I, I would say that's really a big perk because you, they really enjoy the simple things in life. So it's really nice to just have some downtime that way. Um, the expert families, usually they seek international students to babysit. So usually the expert families, they are looking for students who can speak English, students who have a bit of a bit of time, not that medical students have much time, but a bit of time to, to even to just speak English to their children. If they're like, for example, my family is a French German family, so they speak French and German at home, and they go to like a Czech English school, let's say, and I come and I speak English with them. So I think it's a good way for them to enforce just, just the, the child speaking, like not mixing all, all these languages that in one. Um, the, I would say also that a good pro is that it really teaches you patience because those who have younger siblings, I'm sure are really aware that you need to have a lot of patience when it comes to young kids. And, and yeah, it's quite a, it can be a handful, especially if it's three, three kids. Um, and then the last pro I, I wrote that it's really a good experience on how to deal with young kids. Again, like I said, if you don't have no experience like me, um, I would say also it's really good that if one is patient and you don't be patient and if you learn to be like quite like you have to be the one that's quite excited and eager to to see these kids because at the end of the day, they could be in a bad mood. And so it's up to you how you respond to these kids. And I think that's a good way to deal with it. Again, if you're thinking about becoming a pediatrician, it's a good way to kind of prepare yourself on how you have to approach children in general. Um, some cons to this job is that, again, you need to really be, you need to really like kids, <laughs> firstly, very important, and you need to be able to deal with their moods because it's very good. Like if you're having a bad day and a long day and then you go to work, you need to be, be like ready that they could be in a terrible mood or in a bad mood and not want to see you. And they're not your number one fan that day. So you need to be really just mentally <laughs> prepared for that. 
Um, another con is that you really have to clean up for these kids in every way. You have to bathe them sometimes. If they were like when, when the youngest one was really small, much smaller than she is now, I have to change diapers. I have to clean off them when they eat and when they eat, you know, if they use the bathroom, all, all those sorts of needs. So it's, you have to be <laughs> prepared for that too. And the last con I wrote here was just for people searching, looking for babysitting jobs. Usually I found that families prefer female babysitters. So it's quite difficult for our, like our, for males, for guys in general, to find a job as a babysitter. Because I think the stereotype is just families prefer females. But I'm sure there are those odd families that would be open to both. Again, it's just dependent on, on the situation. Um, so where I would recommend you to find these jobs, my number one tip is to use Facebook. So there's like Facebook groups, like I know there's one called, I have it open here now, it's called Cleaning, Babysitting and Other Services in Prague. And there there's usually families that post about, a post saying like a, that they're looking for a babysitter at this age, who can speak this language, this is how much they're offering. And if anyone's available these times, and then you can directly message them all the other way around. You can put up a post on, on, that, on that group saying that I'm looking for a job as a babysitter. I speak this language, this is my rate, et cetera. And the websites um, that we can use also is like, I know expats.cz, they have like a link of a whole lot of websites, but usually these are through like babysitting agencies specifically. So maybe there it's a bit more, let's say more official and less like personable because again on Facebook, you can kind of investigate the people a bit, a bit more. And yeah, that's all I have. And just this, some background on this, on this uh, photo. This is just a photo of me with the youngest, the youngest girl I babysit. And just to get, give you a hand, like an idea that this photo was taken by the other girl when I was looking after her, who was not happy. She took my phone and took a photo of us, which of course in the moment it was a disaster. <laughs> but then later on, I looked back and it was quite cute. So this is the pros and cons all, all mixed together. All right, um, that's all. So if anyone has any questions, I don't know if we should do it now or at the end. Uh, now would be good, yeah. yeah. Any questions? Do I, do I need to speak some Czech? So again, it depends on, for example, I, I'm with an expat family, so they just want me to purely speak English with, with, my, with my girls. But again, if you, if you look for, a, a, like a, if you speak Czech and you can offer someone a Czech service, then yes. But you, as an expat family, they'll just require you to speak English or if you speak their certain specific language directly. Mm, okay. All right, anyone else? Any other questions? Mm. Thank you. All right, guess not. So thank you, Isabel, for um, giving us a talk on babysitting jobs. That was ac excellent. And next we have teaching jobs. Um, Yes, teaching jobs. Teaching jobs will be covered by me. Um, let me give an introduction about myself. My name is Avril Chandel. I'm a fifth year medical student at the second faculty of medicine. I'm also the uh, media lead here at UIMS. Um, I currently work two jobs. Um, one, I teach histology and embryology at the second faculty of medicine. I also teach English at the Ministry of Drug Control, also known as SUKU as well as the Ministry of Agriculture here of Czech Republic. Um, and honestly, teaching jobs overall, um, they're the best. They're really good. They, the pay is usually really nice. You can expect more than 200 crowns an hour, especially if you're teaching um, adults. Teaching jobs are really easy to schedule around your university classes. If you are teaching, um, let's say, English or some other foreign language, People normally want to learn them in the evening, so you can schedule them easily at the end of the day, around like four or five, maybe some people want in the afternoon too, but they normally don't interfere with my university classes. And when teaching histology, embryology, um, I normally inform my teachers well in ahead, um, like, hey, I will be absent for this, this class because I have to teach histo and they're normally fine with it and uh, I don't get an absence on that day. The cons of teaching is that it can be quite competitive, especially teaching a language. Um, 
or something like English. I know online teaching jobs are very competitive because they have um, um, quite good remuneration, like they pay you quite well um, online. But yeah, it's there are, there are a lot of people in the in this market because a lot of people spend pretty much their entire life doing this. This is their main source of income. People are teachers full time. So you're kind of competing with these people and you kind of have to consider that um, when thinking about these jobs. So I've divided my experience um, widely as teaching science and teaching languages. Teaching science would include teaching histology, embryology, maybe um, anatomy, and also as well as um, teaching high school subjects like biology or like chemistry, physics, versus teaching languages. I mainly teach English, but I'm sure um, there are a lot of Europeans here who speak other European languages, which I know are quite in demand around um, Prague at least. So teaching science subjects, um, you need to have faster subjects. So obviously, you know, have a high school diploma or pass histo, pass anatomy, and only then you can teach it. They're kind of hard to get. So yeah, uh, most of the times you might have to um, do an exam. Like I know in my faculty, you'd have to write an anatomy exam to become a a demonstrator and then after two or three times you do that you can then um, become a teacher histology you have to do really good in your final exam um, or you get recommended by some other lector or something like that to get the job um, in teaching science you need to prepare well um, this is quite important to know like sometimes it takes me like a whole day to maybe prepare for my histology seminar the next day. So it can be um, quite time consuming to teach um, subjects that you did in like your first year. These are quite um, you know, advanced concepts, let's say to explain, because people will have um, questions for you and you have to be able to answer them. So you need to prepare quite well, know your concepts, know your basics, um, and that takes time and effort. Pay varies based on subject and uni. Yeah, like different departments have different budgets, so they'll pay you differently if you're teaching um, or tutoring high school subjects. If you teach closer to exam period, you might get more um, money if, you know, if you're doing like a crash course of sorts, helping them revise for the exam. So um, those are all pretty good. And what's most important, I think, is that these jobs are really good for your CV. So when you apply for like, um, a job uh, like junior doctor jobs or something like that um teaching experience especially something like obviously university subjects anatomy history if you teach that that's that looks really good on your cv but also being able to teach um biology chemistry or physics also reflects quite well because then it shows that you have the ability to hold classes um interact with people answer questions and these qualities are quite important in the field of medicine i would say alternatively you could teach languages. Um, teaching languages, I would say, um, at least in teaching English, there are two categories of people. There are people who are non-native speakers and native speakers. If you're a non-native speaker who is fluent in English, like um, I am, you might need um, a certificate like this, TFL, TESOL, CELTA, something like that, and or experience. Um, for example, I started teaching English in the middle of the pandemic. I started teaching online. Um, they didn't require me to have any of the certificates, but they wanted me to have experience, which I did um, teaching while I was in high school. So I was volunteering, so I had that experience and that worked out for me. But, it's, but if you're trying to teach here locally in Prague, I would um, ask you to get these certificates if you're a non-native speaker, because it really helps. Alternatively, if you're a native speaker, let's say from USA, UK, Ireland, Canada, um, New Zealand, Australia, um, New Zealand, Australia, um, one of these first, um, you know, where English is the first language. In these countries, if you're from these countries, maybe um, you can get jobs quite easily. And I would really recommend you to look for online teaching jobs um, versus looking locally because online teaching jobs pay a bit more especially to native speakers. So if you're a native speaker, um, check out online teaching jobs. They pay up to like $15, $20 an hour sometimes. So it's really good. Um, then oftentimes you need minimal prep. I think this is the best part about this job that 
like as I said, it took me, it sometimes it takes me a day to prepare for a seminar in Histo, just one seminar. In comparison, I literally took a day off at the starting of this semester and I planned out my entire course for the next four months. <clears throat> so the payoff is like crazy good. You can pick up exercises from um, textbooks that you've used in high school, textbooks that maybe like a company um, is giving to you. You can use all of that um, and basically prepare quite well. Um, and you don't need a lot of time. The downside of it is that there, it makes minimal difference to your CV, teaching English or teaching Swedish or teaching any other language. Yeah, it's nice that you can speak to people, you can hold conversation, um, but it doesn't, um, let's say, reflect as positively as it would if you were teaching anatomy or history. So if you want CV points, um, consider teaching something like that. And if you want to just kind of make money, um, consider teaching languages because it's quite good. You can do as many classes as you want. Um, and yeah, the pay is directly proportional to that. Um, yeah, and I think I missed the uh, plenty of jobs part. Yeah, there are plenty of jobs in Czech Republic, I would say. I mean, Czech Republic, I think on a recent survey was um, ranked fourth lowest in Europe in terms of English speakers. So there definitely is definitely a big market for um, teaching English. You just need to um, apply and kind of like hope for the best, honestly. Um, that's um, all I have to say for this topic. Does anyone have any questions about teaching jobs? Please drop them in the chat and I will answer them now. All right. So I guess there are no um, questions about teaching jobs. Then we can move on. Next up, we have um, medical jobs. Medical jobs will be presented to you by Yasmin Mansoor and um, Soy Moon. Um, these are my dear colleagues. And yeah, let's get started. First, we'll have Soy. Uh, first, we'll have Yasmin. Yasmin um, is working as a nurse in Brno. She's a fifth year medical student, and she's also the alumni lead here at UIMS. So Yasmin, please take it away. Thank you, Avi. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yasmin, fifth year medical student studying at Masaryk University in Brno. Uh, I'll be talking about medical jobs and I will be sharing from my own experience as a medical student in Brno. Uh, so basically, I, uh, yeah, Avi, could you just uh, put the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, so I got uh, here, in burnout jobs as testing, vaccination, and as a nurse role at the COVID department in the hospital. Uh, basically, since it's COVID related and you're under risk, then the pay um, is between 200 to 300 crowns per hour. If we talk about testing or vaccinating, it's normally about 300 crowns per hour. The nursing role, it's 250 on the weekend is paid extra. So it could reach 250, but you need to be a medical student in the fifth or sixth year to be considered as in a nurse position. Uh, regarding the shifts, uh, testing and vaccination is quite flexible and it varies. It could be between two hours up to 12 hours. However, the nursing role, it's always like 12 hour, either you get like day shift or night shift. And as a part-time job, um, it's, it's really good there is, that there is no minimal amount of shifts that required. Uh, so you can choose uh, as much as you want, depending on how much they need you. Uh, how can you find such uh, jobs? Uh, basically, in my case, it worked best as knowing people in the Czech program. Um, basically, it was kind of through Facebook or it could be also through the university. There is like a, some kind of volunteering center where through it, you can get into some opportunities to volunteer in the hospital. And after some time, you can ask for a contract to work and get paid, actually. Uh, so now let's move to the pros and cons. Um, regarding the testing and the vaccination, the shifts are really short, which is really good because you would have more time for, for other stuff, like studying, attending classes, and everything. It's quite well paid, and it's easy to perform. 
Uh, vaccination, it's it's quite, I would recommend it more than testing, because if you talk about um, the skills that you could acquire from uh, vaccination, uh, it would be more because you would be having to take, you would be doing anamnesis and since you would be taking the anamnesis, uh, you get acquainted with more people and their problems. Um, so it's it's more relevant uh, to whatever we're gonna be doing in the future. Uh, you would also need to know how to handle and apply vaccines. Um, however, if we go through the cons regarding the testing, uh, you would be have uh, you would have to wear protective measures. Uh, which is including the suit, which is really hot when it comes to summer and it's really cold when it comes to winter, especially that you can't fit anything under the suit to get warm. Uh, and the risk of catching the disease is really high because um, you get in touch with positive people on a daily basis all the time. Uh, so now re regarding the pros and cons uh, for the nursing role, the night shifts can be really calm. Uh, most of the time we have like three to four hours either to rest, to sleep, or you can even study. Um, however, like some shifts can be really challenging. And, um, but you, you get to have a real patient experience as you're meeting real patients and you can, you can follow up with how do they do if they actually respond to the treatment well or not. Uh, you learn the dynamics in the hospital each one, what is his role and what they're actually doing. You acquire practicing skills as they can blood, um, replacing cannulas and so on. And you can get the opportunity to join doctors during their rounds so they can explain to you the, the background of the patients, why are they there and how are they been treated, which can be a really good experience. It's quite well paid and a bit extra on the weekends. And it's really good for the CV, I think. But however, the, the shifts are really long, like 12 hour shift, if, if it would be quite demanding, of course, it depends on how many patients you have. Um, it, it can be really long. And also you need to wear the suit as well. And the risk of catching the disease is really high. So that's all from my side. Does anybody have any question? Um, I guess no question. Oh, we. Yeah. How well How do you need you... to know check? Well, it depends. If uh, if we're talking about testing, uh, then you can just memorize a couple of sentences, like how to give instructions um, regarding how to tilt the head backwards and so on. But with vaccination, you would have to do anamnesis. So I would um, recommend to go through the, the book like the checkbook that we had, it could be really helpful. But the nursing role, you really have to communicate with patients all the time. So, I mean, I'm not native speaker or anything. I just learned from the, the check we had during our studies and it really helped a lot. But you don't need to submit anything like in order to get accepted. Are there any minimum age requirement for a nursing role? Uh, well, they just require um, some kind of confirmation of studies that you're on the fifth year or sixth year, but otherwise they don't look at the age. Mm, any other questions? Mm, guess not. All right, I, thank I you. I guess Yasmin. that's it from my side. Thank you, thank you. Um, that was Yasmin's experience of um, working in Brno. Now we have Soy. Um, she is a fifth year medical student at the second faculty of medicine, as well as the head of student affairs at LF2 Ames. Soy, please tell us about your experience in working in Prague. Hi everyone, thank you for having me here. Uh, so my experience is a little bit different from Yasmin's because I work at a private clinic. Um, the pay is almost nothing, but, you know, we don't do this for the pay. Uh, usually we, you know, you get paid in experience 
and other perks, which I'll talk about later. And currently I'm working four to five hour shifts. Well, I guess actually three, between three and five hours, depending on how many patients there are that day and about one to three times a week. And as I wrote here, these um, shifts are very flexible and they really understand at this clinic, they really understand that we're students and don't expect too much. And uh, everyone's very friendly. Everyone speaks English and it's a foreigners clinic. So um, you speak English to everybody. I just practice my check once in a while if I see that a patient is Czech, but usually they also speak English. And like I said earlier, this really isn't about the pay. It's about um, meeting these different kinds of people, basically people who you will become as well in the future. And so I really enjoy all the experience that I'm getting from this, not just like the practical nursing kind of work, but also being able to shadow different doctors in different specialties. And that's within an outpatient clinic. And yeah, and further opportunities. Like for example, I was able to, um, we at second faculty, we have a clinical 10 days um, shadowing that we have to do. And I was able to do it with uh, somebody from another hospital, thanks to this clinic. Um, and the cons are, of course, it takes time out of studying. It's not easy to balance. Um, it's not highly paid. And yeah, I mean, my experience is uh, unique in that it's very, it's very flexible, as in like, I didn't even, um, I didn't apply for this job. It was, I got it because... <laughs> Uh, Isabel commented, <laughs> you, not everybody that you work with um, will be great, but you know, that's just real life. Uh, so just my little story is that I was just going to this clinic as a patient. And after a while, just like, because I went there so much for like physiotherapy and stuff, I got to know the staff and eventually they asked me to work there and they had no idea what I would do. And I had no idea what I was going to do. We were just trying to see if I could fit there. And yeah, initially I was only uh, working with pediatric patients, but then eventually, and like, you know, doing vaccinations, measuring them, uh, doing urine tests, you know. And then eventually I wanted to do my internal medicine summer internship there. And yeah, I was just working as a nurse for the GPs. And then I never stopped doing that. And so now I'm doing both. And they also asked me to work with different specialties uh, if I want. And it's been pretty good. It's, and, you know, I, I don't really have much advice about this job in particular, just that, you know, when, whenever you go out in real life, I guess just put your best self out there because in this case, I really, it just kind of fell into my lap and I went with it. I didn't know what it was, but I, I'm not very good at saying no, which sometimes is not great, but in this case, it turned out to be. And yeah, so that's it from me. All right, do we have any questions for Soy? Mm, I guess that's all. So thank you, Soy, for um, talking us through your job here at in Prague and a private clinic. That's excellent. Um, now we have our special guest speaker, Mr. Jan Chermak. He is a legal advisor at the um, Czech, um, Czech, Czech Moravian um, Trade Union Chamber. And he's going to be speaking to us about some basics of um, laws regarding employment and taxes here in Czech Republic. So Mr. Jan, please um, take it away. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. And thank you for, for having, having me. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I will just give you some brief overview of uh, legal regulation of uh, Czech uh, uh, labor market and uh, work relationship uh, in, in Czech Republic for you guys, because uh, just some basic stuff, some pointers what to, what to look out for because uh, like we are going to, I'm, I have like 10 or 15 minutes here and would like to do some questions at the end of it. 
So I can't really like give you a detailed uh, detailed overview and description of what or of all the particularities of of Czech legislation in terms of uh, in terms of work. And yeah, and I will just stick to the points here on the uh, on the PowerPoint on the presentation and give you uh, some uh, some basic info and move point by point at the end of it. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, but keep your questions general in nature because I can't really provide you any legal help uh, regarding specific cases. But I'll try to answer as, as best as I can. Uh, first point is foreigners' access to Czech labor market. Uh, as been already said here, uh, you guys basically have the full access to Czech labor market if you're a citizen of the EU. You're pretty much you pretty much have the same position as as Czech national, and can apply for for any job uh, that you'd like without any uh, without any uh, additional attachments. The only thing you have to guys do is basically if you are staying long term in Czech Republic, which all of you are, uh, you have to notify, I believe, uh, uh, Czech foreign police or uh, about the fact that you are staying here, and that's about it. If you're a third country national, meaning that if you are not from the uh, from any of the EU countries, it's it can be a little more complicated. But since you are all students here, uh, studying uh, studying the university, it basically applies the same. The one thing you have to pay pay attention for is actually to have a uh, that you have to have a like permanent on or long term stay and have. Uh, have any documentation for that but in terms of work you can apply for for jobs freely as as czech nationals as well uh, and one thing uh let's move on to another point uh one uh, there are two possible ways of basically how to uh, how to earn your living here in czech republic either you are working on a work contract you're being an, an employee or the second one is that you are self-employed. Basically, you have uh, your view as a, is an entrepreneur uh, and as an individual a businessman, businesswoman, or business person, whichever you you prefer. And uh, there's uh, there's like several main differences between that because uh, under Czech legislation, uh, if you're an employee, uh, you um, law gives you a, a lot of protection from your from your employer, while while you're self-employed, uh, you basically all the responsibility falls on you. You have to take care of your own administration, of your own taxes, insurance, and and so on. And basically, if you are uh, if you're asked to do any job under self-employment. Which means you get uh, you get you have to get a trade certificate, uh, which is uh, which is unrestricted. You just have to go to your local administrative office, and and get it. But it's only suitable for basically freelance work. So when you're doing stuff like education, for example, or some sort of a creative profession, like I don't know, playing. In musical instruments or, some, or something like that, but you're basically uh, you're not dependent. Uh, you are uh, deciding on your own working time and what kind of a job you will do, what what kind of a job you will refuse. Uh, you can of course use self-employment, but generally, if you are uh, in a position as a standard employee, you will always be working under a, under a work contract. And if you're applying for a job that is dependent, like, I don't know, like job in services, for example, a waitress, and somebody asks you to, uh, you know, do it under as a self-employed person, it's generally, it's not uncommon, but it's generally a big warning sign that something might be, might be sketchy because uh, essentially then all the responsibility falls on you and and you are losing all the protection provided by Czech legislation for the for the employees, and uh, it if something goes wrong, it could cause a heap of trouble for you. So you, but I, I advise you to uh, to be careful uh, when something like that when something like that happens. And I won't 
get back to self-employment. Basically, when you're self-employed, everything fall, falls on your head. You have to take care of yourself and uh, you have very little protection uh, against possible, uh, possible difficulties. Uh, and I will, in, in my further talk, I will mostly focus on, uh, on work contracts and on employee-employer relationship. Uh, if you want to work as an employee, you always need a, need a work contract. It's uh, the basic things that has to be uh, part of the work contract. It obviously has to be always in writing. Uh, if it's not, again, it's a warning sign. Uh, you're basically drifting into a, a gray zone of, of labor market. And it doesn't mean that it can't work out. Like I know a lot of people uh, who, who are that way, but it all, always means that if there is some sort of a problem or if something goes wrong, you lose uh, most of your protection and it's very hard to... Um, to defend yourself against uh, pretty much possible exploitation from your uh, from your quote unquote employer. Uh, the basic stuff that has to be done in the in has to be included in the work contract is the description of your, of your job position, uh, the play the, your workplace, and the starting date. That's basically it. Uh, that cannot be changed without your consent. Uh, anything uh, anything else that is included in the work contract can be described there and cannot be changed without, uh, without your consent. Meaning, for example, if there is uh, the basically how, uh, remuneration, how much money you get for the, uh, for the work, uh, it cannot be changed uh, by your employer or by yourself. And you basically have to work out and agree on a new work contract, for example. Um, if and anything that's that's included in contract has to be changed that way, it cannot be changed by but by just a single party of the of the contract. Uh, termination. Uh, if you want to conclude uh, your work contract, your job, uh, uh, it can be done either one sided. Uh, you as an employee, you can do it pretty much any time you wish, uh, with any reason you wish. Employer is limited. He has to have a specific reason. For example, he is ending his business, he is reorganizing, or uh, you screwed up and done some and basically uh, somehow failed to fulfill your duties. Uh, there's uh, always a notice period, which means uh, the uh, the work contract and the job is still active. We have to still attend the job until. It's usually uh, two months uh, un un until the uh, contract is concluded, terminated, and it's done. Or uh, the, uh, the work, the job can always be terminated uh, by agreement of, of both parties, which means that you and the employer agree on a certain terms of termination, and, and that's done. Uh, one thing to watch out for, uh, sometimes uh, the employer can basically slip you uh, a termination uh, notice, uh, which is how we're labeled as agreement. And it basically means that you are both agreeing on conclusion of the job. And, uh, and it can, for example, it's without uh, the uh, notice period or without severance pay, which, however, would be present if it would be concluded just by the uh, by the employer. So basically, when an employer wants to get rid of you, uh, they will uh, usually first try to uh, agree with you on, on a conclusion so they don't have to pay you uh, the severance, for example. So you have to always watch out for that. Um, in terms of, uh, I will skip the agreements on work. Those are specific uh, working hours and rest. Typically, uh, the, uh, the uh, weekly uh, amount of hours, maximum uh, weekly hours in Czech Republic is 40 hours. Uh, you cannot go over that unless you're working an irregular job. But in that case, the average of wor weekly working hours still have to remain 40, but over a longer period of time. So there's like a longer observation term 
and you can end up working like more than 40 hours one week, but then the other, the next week after that, you have to work less. It still has to remain 40 hour, uh, hours a week on, on average. The maximum length of a working shift, uh, how, how, how long you can, uh, the maximum, how long, how long you can stay at work at, uh, in, in one shift in one day is basically 12 hours. Plus, uh, you can be made to work overtime, which can be at maximum eight hours per week. And with all that, you always have to uh, have to have at least eight hours of rest between uh, between uh, each shift. But there are, there are more details about that. Uh, like there's a lot of stuff. It, there's, for example, like specific uh, cases for medical jobs but uh, those are details we'll have to like answer in questions for example if like if you have anything any specific examples but those will be usually explained to you uh, while uh, applying for the, for the job when it comes to remuneration uh, in Czech Republic there is a minimum wage in effect currently this year 2022 20, uh, it's 16200 uh, of Czech crowns per month on full working contract, meaning uh, 40 hours per week, which boils down to uh, 94.60 uh, crowns per, per hour in, in gross wage, meaning without any deductions. In, if you're working overtime, there's 25% 25 bonus. If you're working on the holidays, for example, there's 100% bonus. If you're working at night, which can be common in, in medical jobs, for example, there's 10% bonus. And there, there's also 10% bonus for working during the uh, during the weekend. Expenses, uh, anything that you need for work has to be provide uh, has to be provided and paid for by the employer. Which means if some if you are uh, attending uh, if you are applying for a job, and the employer uh, asks you to pay for, for example, uh, clothing, or uh, protective measures like gloves, gloves and stuff like that. Or if you if he wants to pay you for some sort of, sort, some sort of a training, which you need to uh, do before uh, applying for the job, basically don't do it. It's, again, it's a warning sign. Uh, it's a red flag, which, which hints at, at, uh, at a possible case of exploitation. Just refuse it, move on. It's, it's definitely better that way. One thing you have to pay for, uh, if you are, for example, commuting to the job, obviously you need to pay for the transportation yourself. Uh, employer only has to provide for anything that's directly tied to the job, meaning during the working time at the working place. Uh, when, if you dam uh, when it comes to responsibility for damages, if you break something, for example, uh, while, while working, if it's done only by negligence, if it's not done on a purpose, there is a limit uh, of what you have to pay, which is uh, 4.5 of your average monthly earnings, which uh, still can be a lot, but there are, for example, insurances provided by, uh, by commercial in insurance companies, and uh, which you can look up and as far as I know, usually most uh, employers have a common sense and they, they are aware that as a student, you probably, they wouldn't probably get anything from you anyway, but it's still uh, something to pay attention to. Uh, deductions and taxation. Uh, when you're working uh, standard work contract, there are deductions for social and health insurance, uh, which basically uh, reduce your your er, your uh, your gross earnings by roughly uh, by roughly 25 30 30% the only uh, the only um, uh, ex uh, ex exception is when you're working uh, when your work is based on agreement uh, to work, uh, which is limited by 300 hours per year, but the, the limit from uh, which is not uh, subject to dedu deduction is about 10,000 uh, Czech crowns, which at today's wages, it means 
basically uh, only a few days of work so you will get over that uh, amount in a as I said, in, in a couple of days, so you'll still have to still have to pay the deductions. And there's the uh, when it comes to taxation, which comes after that, uh, it's the income tax if is 15% of the of your income, but it's for it, uh, it is further reduced by various bonuses and deductions, uh, which are applied, for example, well, there's a basic deduction, there's, uh, there's, uh, if you're and you are, uh, if you're students, there's another deduction, and uh, which basically boils down to not as a huge of an amount. And the most important thing is you don't have to uh, really, uh, really deal with it all that much because your employer can take care of it for you unless you have some uh, other income as well on the on the side. The only thing that he needs is basically, or they, the employer needs, is uh, your your consent, your written consent, and they will do all the uh, tax administration for you, unless you have another job or another way of uh, earning um, uh, of earning some sort of income. But but again, that's that's more complicated. You will have to get an account uh, an accountant for that, and and have a discussion with with them. Uh, when it comes to protection and legal defense, uh, if you're self-employed, as I already said, uh, you're fully responsible for everything. Uh, there is very little protection provided for you. If you are an employee, uh, as I already mentioned, for example, uh, your uh, your employer has, for example, has needs to have a specific uh, regulated reason for letting you go. There is a limit on working hours. There is a limit on on the uh, on the damages. For example, uh, you are definitely a bit safer, but that still doesn't mean that uh, your employer, for example, doesn't necessarily have to abide by the law, and and something can go down the drain. Uh, the best way how to protect protect yourself is as always prevention. If something seems fishy, if there are some of those red flags which I mentioned, don't take the job or or just or just leave as as soon as you can, because uh, it, since you are students, there's like little means uh, how to protect yourself afterwards, because usually these cases, these extreme ca cases of exploitation, end up at at the court. And you will need some sort of some sort of a legal help, uh, either hire a, hire an attorney, or uh, if there is the possibility, join the trained unions at the at the workplace and try to resolve the the case with them. But the it's definitely something which is uh, in um, in which you are in for a for a long run, and it take. In, it can take uh, a lot of time, even though if you're fully in in right. So, as always, if if there is some if there is something hinting at the fact that it's uh, that it's that your that your job is uh, going to if if there's just if there's some of those red flags, just try to have a discussion with your employer. If it doesn't improve screw it, just, just leave and, and find another job. Like current uh, situation at Czech labor market is heavily leaning in, uh, positively leaning towards the side of employees and finding a job, especially in a large city like Prague or Brno is always going to be, uh, always going to be fairly easy. That's about it from me. Um, just some basic uh, overview. If you have any questions, Shoot! Oh, I uh, I'm, I will be reading through the chat, and thank you for 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 your attention. Thank you, Mr. Jan. Um, that was a really good presentation about the different aspects of employment and taxes. Um, any questions? Um, please um, drop them in the chat right now. If not, then we will start wrapping up. Um, all right, if others don't have a question, I might have a question. Um, yes, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, agreements to agreement for work um, that has up to 300 hours um, within a contract, 
um, less than 10,000 crowns will not be um, taxed. Does that also work if you have two of these contracts, if you're working on two of those contracts simultaneously? Yes, uh, which is, uh, it's basically a, 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 specific, a specific form of work contract. There are like regular work contracts, which most people work on. And yeah. then there are two types, specific types of agreements on work. And one of them, uh, which is limited by, uh, by the maximum hours of work you can do per year, mm. uh, those, those 300 hours, uh, you can have multiple of them, but the 300 hour limit always is applied for uh, for one employer. So if you, for example, have the work contract with one employer, yeah. uh, you can do another with a different employer, but not with the same one. And you can you cannot basically chain several agreements uh, uh, one after the other at one employer, but you can do like several jobs at several uh, places. It's basically designed for a, for a specific short-term work, for example, uh, when you're working in agriculture so you're basically you uh you make the agreement with a, with a farmer uh he puts you to work for like 60 hours or something you work in their orchard you pick yeah. the produce get paid leave and move on to a different farm for example and close the contract again but okay. it's not suitable for uh, uh for, it's it's suitable only for like limited works uh, typically which uh, you know somehow get consumed over time uh, but not for something that is long term when you're working as a nurse for example or in services like and this is the contract the 300 hours one is normally referred to as dpp yes 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 exactly yeah. dpp contract right yeah. yeah so so basically for example if there's a person who has two dpp contracts going on simultaneously um, and the let's say that both of the earnings, even total, do not come up to ten thousand crowns for a month. Okay, um, would then would um, each of the employers tax that money or no? No, uh, it, they wouldn't deduct anything. Okay, they they should not deduct anything. Mm -hmm. And yeah, all right, thank you. So that, 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 was, uh, that was all of my question. Um, is there anyone else? If, any more questions? Um, I guess not. All right, so um, yeah. Th so thank you, Mr. Jan. Um, again, this was really insightful and I think it can it'll help out a lot of people in the future. All right, so here are some of the links um, that we can send to you. Um, as an email after you fill out the form that we have. Um, it's a survey form just to rate um, this event and um, you know, give us some feedback as to how you enjoyed it, what we can do to improve it in the future and so on. And in turn, we'll send you an email with all of the links that all the speakers mentioned today. Um, and yeah, so that, that'll, um, they'll help you out to hopefully land a job in the future. So just to um, summarize before we end this um, talk, um, get a job that you can work around your studies. Please, obviously, um, your education should be on the first place and then you can think about working because you can't really stay in Czech Republic if you don't have, if you can't continue studying here. Um, make a neat CV to hand out. Yeah, as I said earlier, just, you know, choose a job that fits your talent and apply for those jobs and apply and make a CV for each and every one of them. Like, you know, if you want to, if you want to do teaching and medical, uh, make, make a teaching CV and make a medical CV. They could have um, overlapping things, but have them separate. So only the relevant stuff is there and you represent yourself very well. Um, join and regularly check Facebook groups for local jobs. So yeah, if you want to work locally in Prague, um, or Bruno, and basically in, in the Czech Republic, just join Facebook groups. They're really helpful. Um, as you can see, a lot of our speakers today uh, were able to get their jobs because they were on a Facebook group, including myself. Um, I landed my English teaching job because um, I advertised myself on a Facebook group for teaching English. Um, and yeah, consider online jobs as an option. As I mentioned earlier, uh, it's quite nice to teach online. You can kind of um, 
have as many hours as you want. Uh, just open your slots and people just book them. There are many websites out there that you can search for uh, where you can teach online and it's really good for native speakers. And I think one of the most important things is that networking in general is important. Get to know your upper years, get to know locals, um, you know, pe local Czech people who might be able to help you out. The people around you definitely know about jobs. You just need to reach out to them, speak, and I'm sure someone will be um, there to help you out and hook you up with a job at the end of the day. So yeah, networking is really important. Um, especially when you're looking for a um, stable and long-term job. Um, so yeah, thank you for everyone. Thank you to everyone for being here. Uh, we're very happy to be able to share our experiences and yeah, have a nice evening. Thank you to all my speakers. Um, two of them, Yasmin and Isabel were even a bit sick, but they still came through on this talk. So thank you to them as well, even though they were sick. And yeah, have a nice evening, everyone. Thank you and bye. And please don't forget to fill in our feedback form so you can get the links um, for um, uh, the links that we mentioned earlier and the links that the authors have mentioned. So please um, scan this QR code and we'll also have it on the Facebook group um, later on where you can click it and fill out the, Q uh, fill out the form to get the links. So yeah, thank you.